thanks again for joining us for our first uh, annual Retail Innovator Awards. I'm Debbie House, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Retail Touchpoints, and I'm just really pleased and proud uh, to be honoring these great retail executives today and to have all of you here to celebrate with us. So before we continue on with the awards, I just want to give you a quick kind of overview of Retail Touchpoints. Again, like I said, we've been around since 2007. Um, we cover uh, the retail industry. We consider our niche to be the customer-facing aspects of retail. Uh, we do special reports. Uh, we have a, all kinds of awards programs, but features. Um, and we also have a lot of content going up daily on the site, case studies, daily news, breaking news. Um, so please take a look. We, we redesigned our website uh, in February. It was long overdue. So we have a great new website with multimedia video on there. Um, and um, all kinds of content accessible just from, from the home page. Um, so, you know, please, if you're not already receiving our newsletter, um, please subscribe to it. It comes out on Tuesdays. And again, like I said, it goes out to close to 29,000 retail executives every week. At Retail Touchpoints, we track and report on innovations and innovative technology throughout the year. And we believe we're presenting you today with a group of the most influential retail innovators working on behalf of the retail industry. So regarding the process of winner selection, uh, we sent out a call for nominations in early February and then narrowed our, our choices through internal review before selecting the final 16 winners. I'm not going to read the screen uh, behind you, but you can see that our selections were based on a number of criteria. And we were thrilled to receive nominations for many impressive and hardworking retail executives, and even more proud to hear from most of them here today. Uh, also, as a side note, we look forward to another Retail Innovators Award next year in 2015, and the landing page for that's already live, so if you have someone in mind you think would be um, a recipient of this award for 2015, you can actually nominate them um, anytime, even now since we have Wi-Fi in the room. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're anticipating a lot more great strides from our innovators here today during the year, and we're anxious to learn about new innovations for our future future potential award winners. Um, so now I think we're going to get started with the award presentations. Uh, so our first Retail Innovator Award is, is, present, is being presented to Jeff Rader, who's co-founder of Harry's and Warby Parker. Um, unfortunately, Jeff had a last minute change in travel plans, so he's not able to join us today. But Eric Kimmel, who is head of brand activations, is that your right title, your correct title? I thought so, okay. Uh, is going to accept and speak on Jeff's behalf. And I just want to let everybody know, kind of as a side note, that Eric's not a slouch. Um, as a high school senior, Eric founded Peer-to-Peer -peer Tutors, which grew into the largest peer tutoring company in the United States and was acquired in 2012. Uh, he's also been named to Business Week's top 25 entrepreneurs under 25, among other accolades. So we're really proud to have him here today. Um, and just a little bit about our winner, uh, Jeff Rader. He graduated from the Wharton School of Business in less than two years and is co-founder of both Warby Parker and Harry's. He's also, uh, I'm calling him a mama's boy, his mom, Ann Rader, who also happens to be the CEO of InStream Media, she sent in the nomination for his award. So, yeah, I thought that was very sweet. And she was very excited, uh, as he was, to receive this award. So for those of you who might not be familiar with Jeff's two innovative companies, Harrys.com is an e-commerce retailer that sells razors described as a great shave at a fair price. Warby Parker sells fashionable eyewear at affordable prices, including a try-at-home glasses program. And basically, uh, these companies started a group of really smart guys, got together, didn't understand why they had to spend $600 on a pair of glasses and um, came out with this you know, innovative idea to start this company, and it's just grown and been amazingly successful. Um, the shaving program, uh, shaving company Harry's, also grew out of the same kind of idea, and uh, it's also been extremely successful. Um, Warby Parker has been named one of the top innovative companies in the US by Forbes, and I believe it's valued at approximately $500 million at this point. Um, so in the name of continuing to provide product information, Harry's purchased the German, Germany-based factory that manufactures its products and incorporates customer input into, to upgrade the products on a continual basis. So next, Harry's is introducing a line for women. So look out for Harry's Shaving Club. So now we're going to hear from Jeff via video. Hi, I'm Jeff Rader, the co-founder 
and CEO of Harry's, and also co-founder of Morgan Parker. First, I'd just like to start by saying thank you to Retail Touchpoints for honoring us with this Retail Innovation Award. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, secondly, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about what our companies do. Um, so both Harry's and Morgan Parker are brands of really high quality products. So in Harry's, we sell shaving and grooming products, and at Morgan Parker, we sell eyewear. Um, and we sell directly to customers on our website and in stores at affordable prices. Uh, in doing so, we try to develop really close relationships with our customers, give them great experiences, and hopefully that leads them to want to be loyal to our business and brand for a long period of time. And we also have a devotion to the community. Um, we donate products um, at Warby Parker and, and um, a percentage of our sales and also a percentage of our time at Harry's to help making the community uh, a better place and kind of furthering uh, the mission that our products serve. So thank you again uh, to Retail Touchpoints for this award. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, and uh, we're honored to be here with you today. Hey guys, um, I'm not Jeff, and Jeff's definitely a little bit of a mama's boy um, in, in the best way. Um, so, you know, you heard what Harry's is and what Warby Parker is. You know, at, at Harry's, we really think about our mission um, around preparedness. We want to help prepare people for personal and professional success. And shaving being a frequent and sometimes fleeting way that you do that every day. Um, and when we think about uh, retail, we thought about, you know, how in, you know, in, in New York, in a market where we've really tried to activate launching here, we can create this amazing experience for our customers and get to know them in a really interesting way by having um, a barber shop. So Harry's opened a, a corner shop um, in Soho about seven months ago now. Um, it's on House and McDougal Street. We do an old school straight shave. We do haircuts, and we also sell our product. So we have these amazing barbers on staff. They have, they're experts. They're master barbers. They've been doing what they do, their craft, for many, many years. And we're able to get to know our customers in a new and really interesting and intimate way. And then it also serves as a great way to uh, get folks into our into our uh, shaving uh, product mix as well. So, just really appreciate uh, the award and our learning from all of your many organizations. You know, on how to uh, connect our online and offline in new and interesting ways in the future. So, thank you so much. Um, our, our next winner is uh, Lena Munjal, who is SVP of Member Experience and Integrated Retail at Sears Holdings. Um, I don't have to go deep into Sears Holdings, who they are. Obviously, a lot of people are familiar with Sears. So um, I'm going to focus more on what Lena has done in her position. And as a journalist, I've had the chance to speak with Lena before. And her overall passion for her job and connecting with consumers and creating a thriving community of not only consumers but associates is, is something that I think um, e everyone in the retail industry strives for and can really take note of. So um, full disclosure, I, th I think you know she's going to share a lot of wisdom with us today. Um, in her position, uh, Lena founded and leads the company's Integrated Retail Labs, a team that's charged with questioning the norm and pushing the creative boundaries to redefine the shopping, shopping experience. Um, of her uh, many successes, she's equipped hundreds of Sears and Kmart stores with Wi-Fi and technology infrastructure, empowering associates with tablets and handhelds, and launched several custom apps to help customers make informed purchase decisions. And over time, Sears and Kmart have really become omnichannel organizations, um, and it's reflected in their results. So integrated retail sales, again, that goes across the board from store, mobile, e-commerce. Uh, sales grew 11% in 2013 with a 12% growth online. More than two-thirds of all transactions at Sears and Kmart stores were made by the Shop Your Way members in 2013. Shop Your Way is that community that they're constantly building and refining, and recently they um, unveiled mobile tools that allowed consumers to connect with each other and associates regardless of where they were and at any time. So um, with that, I want Lena to come up and accept the award and uh, share a few words with us.
afternoon. Um, thank you, Alicia and Debbie and the judges at Retail Touchpoints for this distinguished honor. Um, I accept this award on behalf of thousands of Sears Holdings Associates working nationwide in our stores, at our call centers, in our distribution centers, and our corporate headquarters. Uh, congratulations also to my fellow award recipients here. Uh, it is such an honor uh, to be part of a group that's getting recognized for new and innovative thinking uh, and outside the box thinking. Um, not only those who are getting recognized here today, I'm sure many of us here have seen um, the impact of technology in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I can tell you I still remember the days when I used to go uh, to a store to rent DVDs. I'm sure some of you remember that too. Um, or I went to a bookstore to buy a book, or I had to go to a bank to deposit a check. Uh, times have changed. You know, I can, ins I can instantly stream movies to my uh, phone or TV. Um, I don't have to go to the banks. Uh, banks come to me. I can use their mobile app and uh, deposit a check from my home. Um, and buying a book is a breeze. I can do it from the couch uh, with just a few clicks. Uh, my point really is um, technology has changed the way we live, and retail is no exception. Um, the way I used to shop 10 years ago is very, very different than how I shopped five years ago. In fact, very different than how I shopped last year. Um, a customer's sh uh, shopping behavior have changed significantly. Access to information is so easy using your mobile phones. Um, and customers are getting more and more comfortable with uh, alternative ways of shopping, not just in store, but using their mobile phones or online. Um, at Sears Holdings, we saw the potential impact of this shift on a traditional retail model, which is why we've been so focused on what we call integrated retail, also known as omnichannel. Um, but the key difference is integrated retail to us is not just about growing online sales or mobile sales. It really is a mindset. It's a way of thinking with the idea that you want to make it easy for our customers to shop the way they want to shop on their own terms. Um, and that could mean coming to the stores. That could mean uh, buying online. And sometimes that means uh, browsing online and finishing the purchase later in the store. And uh, our assets play beautifully into that strategy as well. Uh, so we have close to about a billion visits between online and our 2,000 store locations. Uh, we have close to 55 million interactions a year through our call centers. Um, we are in the unique position where we get invited to our customers' homes 14 million times a year for things like deliveries, installations, and repairs. And we have 100, over 100 million items online. So we really play a very big role in many of the customer touch points, whether that's home or at stores or online. And what we have done over the past few years is try to weave these channels together um, using a very robust supply chain that makes it possible for us to deliver to 99% of U.S. household in two days or less. Um, and with this shift, the role of stores is changing significantly as well. So it's no longer about serving the customers who are walking into your stores. It's also about serving the customers who want to shop your store, your local store, but they want to do it from the convenience of their home. Um, I think with this shift, what we did was we implemented buy online, pick up in store. In fact, we were amongst the first few retailers who did that about 13 years ago. And since then, we've continued to innovate and um, introduce more technology in the store. So our customers coming in have access to information using Wi-Fi, and our associates have tablets and handhelds that puts information on their fingertips. Um, so this journey has been, you know, really interesting. And uh, I, I think when you take a look at how we think about Sears Holdings, you know, we are very, very proud of our legacy but we also recognize the need to change and to adapt to be able to compete in the 21st century. Uh, I'm ex very excited to be part of this challenge and uh, working alongside a team of very talented individuals um, who constantly push their boundaries to blur the lines between physical and digital worlds. So thank you again uh, for this honor, and I look forward to sharing many new innovations to come this year with Retail Touchpoints. Thank you. Okay, our next award is going to Valentino Vittori, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at Century 21 Stores. Um, I've had the honor of meeting Val Valentino a few times, uh, saw him speak at a recent event, uh, and I can tell you he has a, a lot of passion for uh, making the customer experience the center of things at the Century 21 Stores. Um, so Century 21 Department Stores, um, if you are familiar with Manhattan, I'm sure that you know about Century 21 downtown, their flagship store. It's a fabulous store. 
Um, they describe themselves as a small chain of uh, self-described as a boutique of the off-price. Again, the flagship store is located in downtown Manhattan. Valentino's been with Century 21 since 2012, and prior to his work with Century 21, he was the founder of Improved Design Apparel Company, and he also worked in marketing for Diesel. He's led the charge to launch mobile apps and loyalty rewards in the off-price retail segment, and he's helped to bring together cross-functional executives within the Century 21 organization. His design expertise has been transformed into helping Century 21 with store redesign, uh, which we're going to learn more about in the video that we're about to see. Price is no longer synonymous of luxury. Missoni for Target or Cartographer for H&M, they all proved that a designer can still be relevant at a lower price point. The confusion between what's real and what's fake is jeopardizing the real brand integrity. Our responsibility at this point is to really protect the brand along with the consumer shopping experience. We've been in business for over 50 years and we have an incredible database of loyal customers. We reach over 10 million every single year through our brick and mortar stores. It's almost 45,000 people a day. It's really looking to develop a place, which internally we call it the palace, which has the objective to become in the industry recognized from a consumer point of view as a destination to find original off-price garments. The palace is going to give our top tier designers the opportunity to sell their excess inventory, putting their products in the best light possible and taking it to a higher consumer level. Thank you everybody and thank you for this uh, award. Um, where do I start? I think uh, a retail store and just a retail store in a sense, you know, like a brick and mortar a store, it doesn't matter. What really matters is what you find inside it. It's a how the customers find his way to experience uh, in that specific locations uh, that moment what he's looking for. And sometimes it's not just product. Sometimes it's just uh, a memory that he want to take home. So the half price is really changing. And, uh, you know, it doesn't. we are not just there to sell you something at a better price. We're actually there to give you that same amount of emotion uh, that Apple Store uh, may give you around the corner. So listen, the reality is this one. I think all today we have the responsibility when we talk about innovations, not to really look about ourselves and what we do every day, but to look about a consumer who is more and more and more integrated and he shops my stores, our stores, your stores in the same way. They have the same expectation. And we actually need to start uh, creating collaboration eventually because the success is how we all network each other and we create partnership to give a better value. So for example, not to say, but I think we have 15,000 people in the store downtown. Half of them are men and will love a great shave. Uh, so why don't we <laughs> create partnership in this room to begin with? Uh, bottom line is I hope that you can all come downstairs and see how at Century 21 we are really looking to change uh, the perception of price and make it more into a uh, customer experience. I think that this award really goes to that table over there, if you guys raise <laughs> your hand with me, because innovations always come from inside the company. So the biggest job was to uh, have an executive team uh, that all buy into the evolution of the company, because if you don't own it and you don't feel internally as a team, it doesn't matter what you do, it's, not gonna, it's always gonna feel fake. So I really wanted to thank you all, not to be here today, but especially to really take Century 21 to the next uh, step, because we are really making an awesome, uh, project. Thank you. So our next winners, that's right, winners, we have a uh, power marketing duo up next as our next winners, um, Craig Albert and Jason Bornstein of Bonobos. So for everyone out there who may be unfamiliar with Bonobos, they started out as a online only destination of men's fashion. But um, you know, if you're keeping tabs on the marketplace, you may have seen that they have a series of guide shops popping up throughout the nation, basically serving as a destination for men that just want to hang out, don't really like to shop, and you know, just want to get guidance, right? They want the work done for them, so to speak. So uh, today, um, we're going to touch on a little bit about how they're innovating in the area of marketing. 
So first and foremost, I think it's important to note that they were the first to really spearhead social customer service with their Bonobos Ninjas. That's right, customer service ninjas. And I think they really brought social service to the forefront and um, you know, have really strived to create that fun marketing messaging and um, you know, they make interaction with customers not seem like work. Customers don't feel like they're being marketed to, they feel like they're part of a community, of a lifestyle. And um, one of the examples that we wanted to spotlight is that they're big advocates of user-generated content. We've actually covered a few of their campaigns in the past, such as the Pantsformation campaign, um, where they encourage customers to share photos of themselves and engage with each other, like photos, share them. It's all about social engagement and interaction, and again, tying their brand back to a lifestyle. So with that, um, here's a little breakdown of what a bonobo's man looks like. So with that, um, I would love for uh, Craig and Jason to come up and share a few words of wisdom. Congratulations, guys. Uh, as marketing folks, uh, the, a big power we have is our advertising dollars and trying to think about how we spend our advertising dollars in the digital age. What Jason Bornstein did here, he's our marketing manager. He worked with Convertro, uh, one, of our, one of our vendors, to actually set up a attribution model that took in account uh, all the different touches across catalog, across the physical shops, uh, and across the e-commerce and display advertising, uh, where we could then build narratives around uh, how the customer came to us and, and really let the numbers drive uh, where we put those investments. Um, and so uh, he did an amazing job of, of building out this model that's changed how we shifted our investments um, and, and driven actionable insight. And so that's, that's why we're up here today. Um, so yeah, anything else to add? All right. There we go. Thank you guys very much. Our next recipient is Rudy Herman, uh, who's the SVP of retail sales for AT&T. Um, we've all heard of AT&T, but we might not necessarily think of AT&T as the first company you know, on our minds when we talk about innovation. But um, Rudy is working to change that. With more than 16,000 retail stores, including 2,000 company stores, AT&T is a significant player in the retail space. Recently, with the leadership of Rudy, AT&T has been working to improve the customer experience in bridging the online and in-store experience. Rudy's hyper-focused on integrating digital, digital and online with the in-store experience. He was integral in launching AT&T's first store of the future in Chicago, and similar stores have been opening in New York City and other U.S. locations. The effort has been noticed by many media outlets, including Forbes and CNET. Here's a video to learn a little bit more. We want to be America's premier retailer, and this new store design allows us to take a big step in that direction by creating an emotionally engaging experience, one that focuses on the technology to enable lives, and that's the future of retail. Today we're gonna to take you on a tour of the store of the future, and we're gonna start off in the connected experience zone. We've got three wonderful experiences here. We get to showcase to the customer how a device will allow them to play a song and test it on a particular device. On the community table, we showcase a lot of different stories using beautiful featured products to tell the story and experience. We're now at the Explore Wall, and this is where we get to show the breadth and depth and lineup of all of our wonderful tablet and handset devices. Digital Life, for example, or U-verse Entertainment and Music. We have what we call the community tables, where the customers can interact with eight distinct experiences and learn about our various products, apps, and services that we offer. The future of retail is really about personalized service and education, and we believe this new store design delivers that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to say uh, congratulations to all of the Retail Innovator Award winners for 2014. Congratulations to each and every one of you. I would also like to uh, express my personal appreciation to Debbie and the Retail Touchpoints team for nominating and awarding AT&T for the innovation that we've done in the retail space over the past several years. 
And lastly, I would also like to say that as Jason and Craig were up here, in fact, before they came up, uh, they were showing what a bono bonobus man looks like, and clearly it was not me. Um, <laughs> but I am I'm focused on becoming a big bonobus man, so um, that's my promise to all of you. So hopefully we win next year, and uh, I'll be wearing the skinny jeans and the high-top boots <laughs> when I give my recognition, right? So with that said, um, on a more serious note, uh, AT&T over the past several years have been very passionate about um, the journey that we've been on to deliver an extraordinary customer experience in every single interaction. And so as I, as I think about this award today, uh, this, this, this recognition uh, for the most part is really for the exciting things that AT&T has been doing in the retail space. Uh, for our 2,000 company-owned retail stores and for 16,000 other, 16, other retail, points of, uh, retail points of distribution that we currently have. A few years ago, however, we had to ask ourselves a very difficult question, and that question was, what is the future of retail? And after much research and evaluation, we decided that retail had a future, and it was going to be a little bit different than the traditional retailing that we know of in the past, but retail was fundamentally a key part of the customer experience. As a result of that, we shifted our retail strategy to really mirror how customers expected to interact with uh, the stores uh, in the future. And that led to this new store design that we just showed you in the video that, that, that previously ran. We call this new store our store of the future, and it really breaks, if you will, the mold of traditional telecom retailing. Uh, we've created these experience zones where customers can have these emotionally engaging interactive experience with the products and services that AT&T that AT offers. Uh, we've changed our sales process to where our consultants are more friendly experts as opposed to those employees who are selling widgets to customers and delivering customized solutions for each of their individual needs. We have transformed the way how our customers interact and shop with us as retail employees. And for the most part, it actually goes way beyond the retail store design. We've put a significant emphasis on mobilizing our frontline team members. So if you think about it today, when you walk into the typical AT&T retail store, uh, the experience that one of our retail uh, consultants deliver to the customer is pretty much with a tablet. And they do not have to do anything interacting with the customer or interacting with AT&T throughout the day uh, using a desktop. And that experience in itself has really helped us to really move the customer experience forward. The response from our customers, the response from our employees have been overwhelming. And so with that said, what I'd like to do is thank you, thank you again very much uh, for awarding AT&T for the innovation that we've, uh, we've had in the retail space and really looking forward to seeing you all next year again. Thank you. If you guys want to talk mobile, we got your guy. Our next winner is Gary Schwartz, who's CEO and president of Impact Mobile. He's also author of uh, several books, including The Impulse Economy and Fast Shopper, Slow Store, which were published by Simon & Schuster, Archery of Print. He also is working on a new book covering the Internet of Things as the new app store. So as you can see, Gary's a guy who's always on the cutting edge, always looking ahead for the next hot trend. So we use him quite a bit on retail touch points. So uh, Gary founded and chaired the mobile committee for the Interactive Advertising Bureau, helping to establish a joint task force between the IAB, Mobile Marketing Association, and the Media Rating Council to develop global mobile measurement standards, for which he received an IAB award for industry excellence in 2009. Gary is the recipient of the Macromedia People Choice Award, as well as the Dodge Foundation Award for Innovation. In 2013, Mobile Marketer recognized Schwartz as Mobile Commerce Evangelist of the Year. As if his awards and accolades aren't enough, here's a quick video showing him speak so you guys get a feel for a, how knowledgeable he is of the mobile space. So what I'm gonna tell you right now is we're at a juncture where the phone is about to turn from a Cracker Jack container. And when I mean a Cracker Jack container, under that, all that caramelized popcorn, they're, they're jokes and bubble gum and rings and fun things. It's gonna turn from that into something that is about to connect with the real world, just like the Renaissance. 
It's going to connect with the real world and it's going to fundamentally change mobility over the next few years. And that's what I want to talk to you about today because this phone is turning from an end in itself to a means to an end. So right now the phone is something we put in our pocket and we get all this fun stuff on it. Suddenly the phone's becoming an intelligent server connecting to the real world. And uh, so that's what we talk about with the Internet of Everything. This is Cisco. Uh, John Chambers talking about you know, $19 trillion coming to the economy around the Internet of Everything. And suddenly you know, we're going to be talking about this new sort of revolution, this renaissance, where you have 10 billion connected objects in the world and within a few years, 50 billion. Everything is going to become connected. And so you have connected flowers, you have connected diapers, you have, obviously you know about Nest, connected uh, thermostats, uh, you have connected bras. This is a patent by Microsoft that puts the EKG in your bra to, so you can monitor when you're about to have a snack attack and it, and it alerts your phone. So uh, in, intelligent, intelligent basketballs. Basketballs always knew how badly or how well you played. They always knew that. Now they can tell you. <laughs> okay. So I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can uh, one up that one. Uh, that was actually from a, a, a talk I gave on Michelangelo and the Renaissance, and and uh, and how Michelangelo was an innovator uh, and, and and basically propelled us into the Renaissance, and and I compared, you know. If you if you see the clip, uh, um, Bill Gates to to the dark ages, and then you know Steve Jobs and 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 uh, you know creating a, a a device that we can actually reach data and and uh, explore new things and innovations. So, um, I, gee, what, I think I have two minutes. Uh, I, it's exciting to be at a place where I can start talking about innovation in context. Um, I'm always excited about chatting about innovation because uh, we're, we're at a, such an exciting point as retailers in the market. Um, and, and, and when I say that, I, I don't mean that retrospectively. Uh, to be honest, everything that has, has, has been foisted on us as far as innovation to date ain't nothing on what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, I, I'm, I'm privileged to be part of a company for the last 13 years called Impact Mobile. And we were working with retailers uh, since the, the dawn of time with mobile 13 years ago. And, uh, and, and so we've gone through a number of what I would call revolutions. Uh, and, and those revolutions are about you know, the mobile consumer. It's not about the technology. And the innovations are understanding how to reconnect uh, with that consumer. It's not about the technology, it's about just understanding good old marketing and understanding that consumer and understanding that part to purchase. And so I believe strongly that we're at that point again right now in 2014 where uh, it's another revolution. And it's, I sort of touched on it in that video, but I really feel that for, for, for the last few years we've been focused on the phone and, and putting apps and things on the phone and it's distracted us from our store and our main focus. And I think there's an opportunity now with the, the Internet of Things, um, basically, of creating an app, a store as an app, uh, a, focusing on an intelligent store, where the store uh, can be triggered by the phone. And the phone is the, the DNA of the consumer walking into our, our stores, which can trigger intelligent things. I, just, I flew over from Brussels, where I, I spoke at the Hedna. Uh, event, which is um, the hospitality, uh, the electronic uh, trade organization for the hospitality uh, vertical. And uh, so uh, at retailers, heads in beds, right? The purveyors of sleep. And, and they have the same problem. They have bricks and mortar. How do they make it intelligent? If you go into a hotel, you expect things to happen. When you walk into the room, why do you have to ch turn knobs and and change the heating and everything should change and should be customized to our consumer to delight them and to make it easier for them to to be you know to to have affinity to us and spend more money so it's a great and exciting time it's 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 very timely to have an innovation award now and i'm sure they're going to be amazing winners over the next few years who are going to lead us into this new and exciting time so thank you so much How do you make automotive aftermarket store a fun place to work? 
just ask Manny Mo and Jack. And uh, those of you who have been around as long as I have have heard of Manny Mo and Jack. <laughs> But they don't happen to be here. So we're going to ask Brian Hoppy today, the VP of Store Operations for the 600 store chain. 600, right? Is that what I'm saying? 800. I know. We, were, uh, we said 630, I think. In the, we're at 800 now. Okay, good. So Brian's led the implementation of an online e-learning program for employees at Pep Boys that features gamification. As retailers, you know about challenges of motivating employees to participating in educational programs. At Pet Boys, 95% of their employees voluntary, voluntarily participate in these programs. Pretty impressive. As a testament to Brian and the program, other leading retailers such as Walmart and Toys R Us have copied their strategy. So here's a look at Pet Boys before we hear from Brian. You know, when we came here, we recognized that we had results that weren't acceptable for us in what we wanted to do. So when you have 19,000 associates out there in the stores, you really have to be able to get them to do the right process, get them engaged in, in managing that within their stores. And if we can get people excited about doing the game every day, coming in, answering a few questions, and it sticks with them was, was what we were looking for. If it's me or any of my associates that come in, uh, first thing they do is uh, hop on and they start taking some of the quizzes and stuff. It's more helpful because it keeps you abreast on the day-to-day -day safety issues and things that you need to know. Plus it stays fresh in your mind. We went to Exonify and said, we want a solution that we could integrate into the associates' daily lives. And so that's, that's ultimately what we're looking for. And I like ones that help me with special orders, with different types of safety and stuff, so it helps me. And I do mine in the morning. It takes about five minutes, if that long. I don't want to learn from doing it wrong, because I can't afford to have that. But knowing how to put tires on and what order to put the tires on, and it's actually making me think. We've seen reduced shrink, we've seen reduced accident claims, we've seen a higher level of, of associate engagement, a high, higher level of associate awareness. The fact of the matter is, is that we can do anything we want to, it just takes a willpower and ingenuity and, and ultimately, you know, the plan works. If you make these investments into these things, this is the kind of return you're going to get. So, yeah, the move was, was really, really awesome. First of all, I want to uh, say thank you for um, bestowing this uh, prestigious award to me, and uh, also congratulations to the rest of the winners. Um, it's really, really cool to hear some of the innovative stories that everybody is talking about today. And, you know, when you think about seeing some of the things with the Omni Channel and, and in store designs, and, and it's always really about, you know, getting to what the target audience needs. And what the car, whether it be a customer, whether it be internal associates, whether it be um, just really anybody. And I know, you know, Sears, we talked about the legacy. You know, Pep Boys is a legacy that's a very, very uh, longstanding legacy. And, you know, being a larger retailer, one of our challenges was how do we, how do we communicate to 20,000 associates? How do we get people engaged into understanding and doing and executing against the right thing? You know, being a legacy company, one of the things that we had was a lot of legacy practices, you know, and, you know, we went in and we were doing the, we were doing the, the standard 101 things that anybody would do, you know, posters, uh, you know, meetings and, and so on and so forth. But one of the things my team and I decided to do was go to the associates and say and, and ask them, you know, what matters to you? I mean, is, 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 does this program add value? And it's interesting because... I remember the posters, and I, and I said, uh, what do you think of the posters? And we had about a third of the associates say, what posters? Uh, we had a third of the associates you know, said, oh, they change every month. And we had about a third of the associates that knew what they were and so on and so forth. And you know, I also have to recognize Exonify because I think uh, we were your first customer. And at the time, um, they were part of, a, of the company that was providing the posters, I believe or at least a piece of it. And we sat down and said, we've got to do something different because our associates just aren't, we're not, we're not communicating to them. They don't really understand what it is that we're doing. And, and the first thing anybody says is, is the reason somebody doesn't do what you want them to do is because they don't know what you want them to do. And so we designed this really, really fun platform that made training you know, more exciting where it wasn't kind of forced compliance type of thing. Come in, you know, I'm going to withhold your check until you take your training type of stuff. And we really made it fun and interactive and, and tied prizes and reward to 
how well they adapt, adapted and understood the knowledge. And I think that's something that as, you know, we've grown over the course of time. I mean, um, as some of our store associates is, it really started as a loss control program, but we've over the last uh, year or so began to incorporate more and more operational sales, customer facing type stuff into the original program. It started out refuse to lose. And now we now we uh, we call it a little bit refuse to lose, refuse to lose business. You know, we, there's a lot of different plays on what we're trying to do with it. So, it's it's grown from just really designed to to, to attack a specific problem we had into the uh, a, a huge piece of how we communicate to our associates on a daily basis. So once again, thank you and thanks a lot. So I don't know about you guys, but I love myself a good smoothie. And anytime I'm in New York City or Garden State Plaza, I always have to stop at Jamba Juice. So I'm really excited to present this next award to Robert Note, who's CTO of Jamba Juice. If you didn't come across the Jamba Juice on your walk over to the Yale Club, or if you're not already a customer, Jamba Juice is a restaurant retailer that offers better for you food and beverages, including smoothies, juices, teas, salads, sandwiches, and oatmeals. As of April 2014, there are 854 Jamba Juice stores worldwide. So a little bit of a breakdown in terms of what Robert has done for the Jamba Juice brand. He has led the integration of Jamba's mobile commerce applications by using the national store footprint as a large scale test lab for commerce providers. To drive adoption of ISIS mobile wallet, he led the launch of the Million Free Smoothie and Juice campaign in which customers using the ISIS app could win a free beverage every day until they reach that million point. Four months since the launch, ISIS adoption engagement has steadily increased. Robert meets weekly with Jamba's chief brand officer to drive the brand forward, especially in using technology and innovative ways to engage and market to consumers to keep them coming back for those great smoothies. I heard that we were going to be one of the first companies in the United States to, to offer ISIS. We had a meeting where they trained us, and a week after that, uh, they rolled out ISIS in our stores and there was no glitches. Jamba Juice customers are pretty forward-thinking, pretty tech-savvy people, so they, they, they've seen ISIS around, they've seen the commercials, they've seen the billboards, and they're pretty excited to use it here. ISIS is so intuitively designed that it's been really easy on both sides of the register to understand. I, our customers are really excited about the deals that they can get really quickly with ISIS. They've always got their phones on them, so it makes a lot of sense for us to be engaging with our customers in that way. With ISIS, we can really control what deals we intend our customers to have. Some of the offers that we've been using with our customers have been uh, buy one, get one free offers and also $2 smoothie offers on some of our featured products and smoothies. Rewarding them for being regular customers is great, and ISIS lets us do that better than anything else. Jamba Juice is always trying to stay as closely connected with our customers as possible, but with ISIS, our customers can choose to follow us, which keeps us even more connected, and it's one of the most followed merchants in the ISIS system right now, and that means that we've got a lot more people that have subscribed for our discounts, so it rewards those people who want to be closer to us as a company and puts that power in their hand, which I think is really great. All right, so um, I'd like to thank Retail Touchpoint for this honor. I really appreciate the recognition, so thanks again. I'd also like to thank Jamba for their strong support as they allowed me and my team the opportunity uh, to innovate and enhance the consumer experience. I'd also like to thank our uh, technology part partners for collaborating with us to make Jamba one of the leaders in innovative retail technologies. So you just saw an example of, of, of that uh, with ISIS. We've also done some really great things with uh, PayPal, uh, NCR, and Spengo. So thank you to our, to our partners, and thank you, ISIS, for joining me today. Um, as Jamba has transformed from a smoothie shop to a brand that is all about simplifying healthy living, our technology roadmap has also gone through a transformation. Our technology strategy has evolved from one primarily focused on keeping the lights on to one that explores innovative technologies to drive value to the brand and to our consumers. We're tapping into technology to transform how we engage with our consumers across nearly every touch point from providing the information they need to make their decisions to making the transaction more convenient 
and rewarding. The way we use and integrate technology has transformed how we operate as a company. We are, more, we are much more open to taking risks, are prone to taking action versus spending inordinate, inordinate amounts of time on research, and have tightly integrated IT, the relationship between IT and marketing. While not every initiative is going to be a home run, our driving force is always to enable consumers to shop, pay, and engage with Jamba in ways that works best for them. The key point is that we have never been afraid to try new things. It is part of our DNA. It is what has made us successful. This mindset has enabled us to capitalize on opportunities quickly and provide consumers with better and innovative ways to engage with the Jamba brand. Leveraging technology is not always about ROI. Raising brand awareness, elevating the consumer experience in our stores, creating competitive advantages, and forming strategic partnerships, like, like the few I mentioned earlier, are examples of key benefits that are, that are difficult to measure from an ROI perspective, but no, nonetheless, they are still very important to any brand. At the end of the day, it is all about serving our customers in a manner that aligns with their lifestyles. So thanks again. Our next recipient is Kevin McKenzie, who's Global Chief Digital Officer for Westfield Labs. Um, so as the number of malls and indoor shopping centers uh, continue to de decrease in number, Kevin McKenzie and his team are determined to develop new opportunities in the shopping center space. Enter Westfield Labs, an entity of the Westfield Group, which serves as a global digital lab focused on innovating the retail, the retail ecosystem by leveraging social, mobile, and digital market opportunities that converge the digital shopper with the physical world. Westfield Group has one of the world's largest shopping center portfolios with 87 centers in Australia, New Zealand, the US, and the UK. Last year, more than 1 million customer visits generated over 40 billion in retail sales. Kevin and his team are hard at work incorporating web, mobile, and digital into the mall experience, along with introducing new business models. All retailers, I think, can learn from Kevin's success story. Let's watch. One of the biggest initiatives with Westfield Labs is to completely reinvent wayfinding. Actually inject incredible discovery and use wayfinding and mapping as a mechanism to show users not only where to go, but actually what products and services and trends are around them. With one click, we're going to make that all portable right to their mobile phone so they could take that with them and go right to their destination. We're not just thinking about the digital experience, we're putting a lot of work into the physical experience. Services like hands-free shopping, once you pick out and buy the product, to have it delivered right to your car or even your home. We partner with some of the greatest chefs and restaurants and consumers love the food experience at our shopping centers. We want to make that experience even better using digital technology. Give them the utility to pick out what they want before they get there, have it ready for them when they arrive, to maybe even having it delivered to their home or to their office. Well, I wanted to first thank uh, Retail Touchpoints for uh, honoring us today. We're a, we're a new group in an old company. Westfield's about 54 years old. Um, and it's still around because it's constantly reinvented itself throughout the years, you know, starting from being born in, in Australia as a company, moving out to the U.S. in the 80s, and now most recently in England where we have um, are started to reinvent high street shopping in, in London uh, with, with Westfield Stratford and Westfield London. Um, it was really great uh, to hear from several amazing retailers today uh, and everything that they're doing. I can remember the early days of online where there was a lot of people that were skeptical about uh, it working as a channel. And a lot of companies, I think, were late to the game. And now with this total convergence that's happening between physical and digital, I don't see that at all. Um, you heard from so many great uh, innovators today and what they're doing, the programs that they're initiating in their companies. And I think when you have all of that happening at the same time, I think there's a lot of great things that happen. And with Westfield, we're an aggregator of retailers. We're not a retailer. Um, and you know, the way we think about um, the future is probably less being a shopping mall 
and more being an experience center um, where we not only where we're really a destination where we provide not only a place to shop but a great destination that offers food offers great experiences and of course retail and it's our job at Westfield Labs to bring that all together and bring that experience both online and offline um, to the consumer so we're honored to be here today we're just getting started um, and uh, we're looking forward to working with with everybody in the retail industry thank you So our, our next recipient is uh, Ed Renneman, who's Chief Transformation Officer at Crate and Barrel. Um, so for those of you who might not shop in this specific segment, you've probably certainly heard of Crate and Barrel, which is now a 170-plus uh, American chain of retail stores located, based out of Northbrook, Illinois, specializing in housewares, furniture, and home accessories. Um, as the Chief Transformation Officer for Crate and Barrel, Ed has improved labor spend and accuracy using real-time traffic monitoring. Monitoring, These efforts led to a 6% weekly conversion rate increase at a test store. Today, we're honored to have two of Ed's key innovation team members joining us to speak about Ed and the innovative strategies at Crate and Barrel. Chris Fry, Director of Innovation, and George Feinling, Director of Emerging Technologies. First, let's watch a quick video about the company, and then we'll hear from Chris and George. Hi, I'm Sasha. Okay. And we then all right. All right. Go, go. We got this. That Hi. was much better, by the way. Th thank yeah, you. It was very good. Hi, I'm Sasha Bob, CEO at Crate and Barrel, and I'm Marta Kaje, President and Chief Merchant. We love working. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, you didn't see Ed in that video at all. Uh, uh, that was our CEO and president. Uh, gives you a little bit of an idea of the environment at Crate and Barrel that Ed operates in. I'm very serious. Uh, and oddly enough, neither of us are Ed. So uh, Ed, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks the, uh, the, the Retail Touch Points for uh, this award. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to attend. Uh, his important uh, install happening today back in Chicago. So uh, he sent us. Uh, we are uh, two of his direct reports, and we're happy to accept on his behalf. Uh, I'm Chris Fry, Director of Innovation. George Finling is uh, Director of Emerging Technologies. Just thought we'd take a couple minutes to talk about why we think Ed's an innovator. And, uh, um, I, you know, Ed has always been recognized as a business uh, for his business orientation and focus on customer service and conversion. He's been a kind of a store guy, though he's been the CIO for quite a, quite a while. So uh, much of Crate and Barrel is about the store experience. Uh, if you've had a chance to work in the store or, see, or, or visit the store or work in the store, as all of us have, uh, you, you know that that's where the, the, the culture is, is, is created. And we've done our best to try to, to enhance that experience and then also to um, uh, bridge it into the other channels and other ways of shopping. Um, as longtime CEO uh, or CIO, Ed has uh, navigated technology in a kind of interesting way. He's, uh, you know, he's assessed systems. He's, uh, you know, always sort of tried to not keep up with the Joneses. There's been a lot of opportunity to, to buy the new thing, to, to try the new thing. Uh, we've done a lot of in-house systems. We've done a lot of custom systems ourselves. Um, so, you know, he's, you know, he's focused on the value, less on the, on, on the curb appeal, I guess, and, and its direct impact on, the, on our associates and on our customers. Uh, however, um, sort of to demonstrate some of his innovative, innovative leadership, about 2010, uh, Ed had a vision to uh, and had a vision had the vision and the audacity, I would say, to champion a crate and barrel uh, uh, major internal systems innovation uh, transformation. Uh, and and interestingly, it, it he uh, not only did he did he champion it, but he had a precise definition of that transformation. He proposed a scope, he planned it, he created a business case for doing so, and uh, you know it was pretty comprehensive. Ninety. So key business processes, pretty much most of our supply chain, most of our, uh, our store systems, um, and, uh, you know, like I said, about 90. Uh, the other thing that was interesting about it wasn't, which is sort of unusual, especially for the time, wasn't dominated by one particular s solution provider or, or software provider. It was, a, was meant to be a best-of-breed integration of all the different things that Crate and Barrel does and, and the systems and the software that can support that. Um, 
So as a result, uh, you know, as he presented this to the board, the board accepted it, and as boards are wont to do, they put him in charge of it. So he, uh, you know, a few years ago was promoted from CIO to Chief Transformation Officer. Um, his efforts have not only provided Crate and Barrel with a continued lead in the markets they serve, but also, I think more importantly, he's, a, he's been, done a good, very good job evangelizing uh, transformation through tech, using technology within the company. And uh, I think George is going to talk a little bit more about the transformation project that he's leading. Uh, so there are a lot of really cool, fun things to talk about with Crate and Barrel, but I, I'm here to talk about Ed. I, I've known Ed for almost 20 years. I've worked for him for over half of that, so I've been able to observe his habits up close. Um, he, I, I think, is a true visionary, and when I say visionary, I, I don't mean he makes grand proclamations about what's going to happen in the next 10 years. He has this great ability to survey the landscape, the technology landscape, the business landscape, the, the consumer landscape, and see where we need to be going in the next three to five years. And I've seen him do this over and over again. Um, he, five years ago or so, you know, Crate and Barrel's a 50-year-old company, very set in our ways in, in many of the things that we do. Five or so years ago, um, he, again, surveyed the landscape and said, we, we need to change. We're, we need to be more agile. We have aging legacy systems that need to be addressed. We need to change not just systems. We need to change processes, organizations. We need to reinvent Crate and Barrel from within. Um, sold it to the CEO. He was on board. Sold it to the board. Took it to the board of directors. And within days, he was our chief transformation officer. And then we we're off and rolling. And we have been, for the past three years at least, uh, embarking down this very large transformation initiative. We're, we're transforming our systems, many of them um, home, homegrown, um, built by Ed himself 20 years ago. We were 70-30 uh, mix build versus buy, changing that to uh, uh, you know, more of a 30-70 buy, uh, buy versus build, really focusing on what differentiates. And I think that was um, the, the, the key thing. He was able to uh, drill in on, on what really differentiated and made Crate and Barrel different and where we should invest our resources and talents and where um, the, the, the business and the systems and the, and the process have become commodity and we can um, uh, focus our talents where they need to be. So um, I don't know. That, that, that's all I have to say. It, 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 it's been great working for him. He, he, he really is fun to work with and fun to watch and I'm curious to see what he comes up with next. So uh, thank you on behalf of Ed for this award and Chris and I are honored to accept this for him. So not to draw attention to a mistake I made because, you know, they, they don't happen very often. But um, I have to give a personal hats off to the Peapod team today. Uh, you'll notice in your program there's a different photo than the one you see on this slide. Um, so first the answer is no, Andrew Parkinson has not changed dramatically since the printing of the program. Um, we did make a mistake and use the picture of his brother and co-founder Thomas in the program. And weren't, we were not able to fix a mistake before printing. Um, but as a testament to the Peapod team, Tony Stallone, who's accepting today on Andrew's behalf, sent me an email a few days ago that said, uh, the mismatch headshot will be a good opportunity to demonstrate Andrew's behind the scenes, not willing to take credit mentality that inspires all of us who work at Peapod. So I want to thank you again, Tony, for understanding and thank the entire Peapod team for that. But of course there's much more to Peapod's innovative spirit. The company opened a digital innovation center earlier this year. And customers at the Stop and Shop and Giant supermarkets can use the new pickup point system to order online and schedule a pickup time. Additionally, the company is dedicated to giving back to the community through its Kids Give Back program, in which students learn how to buy nutritious foods and then donate the food to local food banks and pantries. So let's take a look at Peapod in this video. My name is Thomas Parkinson, and I'm one of the founders of Peapod, the grocery shopping and delivery service. Hi, this is Thomas Parkinson, and my brother and I founded Peapod almost 22 years ago. It's hard to believe it's that long, and I, you know, I think I still look pretty young. This is Peapod. This is one of the uh, world's foremost internet grocers. Great concept, the concept of you order online and it just comes to your house. Here's the man who thought of it, Andrew Parkinson, along with your brother. All you need to do is take the diskette that you received in your Peapod starter kit and insert it into your disk drive. If you can believe it, 22 years ago, we actually gave out a diskette 
for you to put into your computer using the MS-DOS operating system and dialing up on a modem. Today, it just seems so crazy, but you can use an iPad or an iPhone or an Android device, and you get this unbelievable experience without all that technology in the way. We started Peapod because we wanted to deliver groceries in the highest quality way that we could to you. And we feel that we've been good and kept on that promise for 22 years. Because if we ever make a mistake, we always want to make it right for you as the customer. Ever since we started Peapod, we've had a passion to make it the best experience you could ever have. When my brother and I founded it, we were the original shoppers and drivers, and we cared so much about delivering a perfect experience to you. And even today, 22 years later, we care even more about that. I'd like to welcome you to the pod, and happy shopping. <laughs>
Innovation comes from the customer. We listen to the customer, we investigate, we research, and then we develop what the customer is asking for. And I think a lot of it is examples here from Harry's to 20, uh, Century 21 to Bobles. And I, I had purple shorts when I was a young kid, so I was ahead of my time like Andrew too. So that's where we believe innovation is and going in. It's great to just be part of it. It's great to be recognized by retail touch points. And uh, on behalf of everybody at Peapot, we're always very excited to talk about our business and we're very proud to accept this award as well. Thank you very much. Greg Busick um, is a retail innovator in a non-traditional way. Through his efforts, the Retail, retail Orphan Initiative, or Retail ROI, has raised more than $1 million to help vulnerable children worldwide. Uh, personally, I met Greg close to 10 years ago and recognized his passion for his work as a retail industry analyst, as well as his devotion to humanity. He's not here today because he's traveling on behalf of Retail ROI, but we're honored to have Vicki Cantrell, SVP with the National Retail Federation and former retail executive, most recently with Tory Burch, to accept on his behalf. Uh, I'm going to try not to cry during this video, but here goes. I do this every day in my spare time, as we all do in our spare time, and, and it's hard for me not to cry when I see that video, and I've been in, in all, most of those places. Um, uh, thank you for this award, because um, we love to see that retail ROI is, is recognized. And today also um, is, here with me today is Mark Milstein. Where are you, Mark? Um, Mark is uh, with Ret uh, Retail Connections, and he is also a donor trustee. I'm here accepting for Greg because Greg and Mark and I are the donor trustees that just get to decide where the money goes. What a fun job that is. And we partner with uh, different organizations because, again, the group that supports Retail ROI are just in our spare time. We all have day jobs. and. Um, Greg is the one to be honored, although he does not like to accept awards uh, in, under his name because he believes it's all of us that, that do this uh, great work together. So um, I'm really thrilled that, it's, that retail ROI is being recognized. I've been to Honduras uh, four or five times, and I go in another uh, week and a half, and we built a lab there, and there's 100. You saw the, the stats, and there's a, a lot of... Um, great work being done. Um, the one thing that I, I, I'll do just quickly before I leave is I will, we work with partners to do different things in different countries and in the U.S. And um, we get such gratification because one of the things that we've done is some of the money that we use, 
uh, which, by the way, we're very proud that 95% of the money that we take in all goes directly to the kids. None of us take any, any money. So 95% is something that we're proud of. Um, and what's so cool is this trips are different uh, solution providers in the retail industry that are all traveling together. They're competitors. It doesn't matter with retailers. And we bring our kids, and we have a great time on these trips. And so one of the uh, groups that we partner with is a border monitoring station in Nepal that helps um, uh, save girls from being human trafficked and, and sets up arrests and et cetera. So just to close out, I would like to read you an email that just came to us, uh, to Greg, about a week and a half ago. Hi, Greg and Nicole. Just wanted to touch base and give you a wonderful praise report. Received our bordering monitor stats for the months of April and May. In those two months, 53 more girls were rescued. So this year already, 99 girls have been rescued through the two border monitoring stations. In total now, Retail Orphan Initiative and your generosity is responsible for helping to rescue 510 girls. Wow, can you believe it? This year, so many more girls have been rescued through border monitoring. Also in the past two months, 18 more traffickers have been arrested through the border monitoring stations. That brings the total this year already to having 22 traffickers arrested as a result of having the border monitoring stations. I cannot express enough how grateful I am for your generosity and support. I think about it, 510 girls would not be free if it were not for ROI. The 99 girls that have been rescued this year would not be free. It makes me cry, no really to think that all of these girls and the fact that without our eye they'd be, still be enduring lives of unspeakable horror, as well as the fact that some of those girls would not be alive and would have lost their lives trapped in such darkness. I also think about the hundreds of girls that through the arrest of the traffickers that have been spared. Well, I know that even though all these traffickers were arrested and all will not be convicted, I'm strengthened by knowing some of them will be convicted, some for a very long time, and we've been able to at least take those traffickers out of play. I look as each step we are able to make a, such a victory and give praise to God that he's given us the ability to make a difference. Anyway, I always want you to celebrate when we have add one more girl to the number we've rescued. Each girl to me deserves us to celebrate her life and freedom. So when we raise money at our events, <laughs> and we're able to give money to groups like that, uh, every, everybody can make a difference by helping one person. Um, and I am happy to, to accept on behalf of Greg because even though Mark and Greg and I get to decide where the money goes, Greg does all the heavy lifting and he's an amazing, amazing person. So thank you so much again. Our last couple of awards uh, are, are we, no, we don't have any recipients here to, to speak, but um, we just want to share some insights about them. Um, so I first met John Throwkill this past January during the NRF Big Show. He participated in a video interview to talk about the Container Store's recent implementation of wearable technology designed to help store associates provide a better and more effective customer experience for shoppers. I knew upon meeting John that he was passionately dedicated to this endeavor. He calls it heads up versus heads down approach to customer service. This approach to employee stewardship and customer service is translated into public accolades for the Container Store. The company has been named one of the best companies to work for by Fortune magazine. The Container Store is also known for paying its employees well above minimum wage, which is a policy that helps to attract more loyal employees. So here's a bit from my January video chat with John. There, there's several ways we're doing it. One of the things we're most excited about is the solution from Theatro that we're going to talk about okay. because what we're trying to do is really make it so that the employee doesn't have to go anywhere to get what they need. We are, we're working on applications that are uh, screen-based, tablet-based, uh, phone-based, that will allow them to get information that's, that's very detailed that they need to see on a screen. But we're also trying to think about um, keeping that interaction with the customer heads up. And so a lot of the things that we are presented today are more about heads down. A lot of the, the solutions that are here at the show are, are giving you tools to say, well, you can put this on a screen for an employee, you can make them mobile enabled. And what we don't think works, especially in our environment, is the idea of an employee engaging with a customer while they're staring at a screen. So they're still with the customer, but they're Absolutely. not really with the customer. Right? Exactly <laughs> right. And even if they're not with a customer at that moment, the idea of employees constantly staring down at a screen is not real appealing to the customers coming in. 
it doesn't look like that person wants to engage with them. Right. So we're trying to think of ways to, to make sure that we give them the right information, but make it so that it's also very heads up if possible. So as a VIB or very important beauty insider, um, I'm excited to present this next award to Jenna Marcus, who is Director of Digital Business Development for Sephora. Um, sadly, she couldn't be here today, but we have uh, Lisa Manns here who will be grabbing the award on her behalf. For those who don't know, and I'm sure that's not really anyone in this room, Sephora is an international omnichannel cosmetics retailer with its Beauty Insider program, Sephora TV, an augmented reality offering, and its beauty board uh, social commerce platform. Sephora provides a variety of ways for customers to engage with the retailer and its products across all touch points. Jonna specifically has spearheaded a lot in um, Sephora's efforts to connecting the in-store and online worlds. She's managed the mobile marketing and strategy for Sephora and was named one of iMedia's top 10 hottest digital marketers of 2013. And she spearheaded Sephora's move to omnichannel integration, helping to execute digital beauty insider cards, e-gift cards through Passbook, and Sephora mobile platforms. So all you Sephora customers out there, all those little touches that make shopping with the brand so easy, I think at the end of the day, we can really um, attribute that to Jonna's efforts. So uh, Lisa, if you're in the room, please come on up and accept the award on Jonna's behalf. These last two winners uh, couldn't be with us today and no one from the company could join us, but um, we still thought it was important to showcase their companies and what these winners have done um, to move the retail industry forward. So this next winner is Jane Park, who is founder and CEO of Julep. And um, Julep is a multi-channel beauty brand offering nail polish and makeup, as well as skin, nail, and body care products. Um, they sell their products through Sephora and I believe Nordstrom, and they've um, done a few pop-up stores here and there throughout the country. Um, Tapping into its mavens, which is basically their base of loyal customers, Julep collects insights from its most loyal customers on new products that they're thinking about selling on, on a mass scale, uh, nail polish colors, and potential innovations. So any new product, tool, nail polish color, they send to their mavens and ask for feedback before they decide to go to market with it. And um, in a conversation with Jane once, uh, she said that they're – turnover rate or, or their release and development of new products is um, tremendously faster than, than any other beauty brand out there. So I think tapping into your customer base is, um, is a benefit in the long term. So uh, Jane was featured in Fast Company as an innovative CEO um, for her efforts in building the Julep brand, their principles, and obviously the Maven program. And uh, she's no stranger to innovation. So prior to founding Julep, Jane um, served as director of new ventures at Starbucks for three years. So she really, really knew what it was, um, what it took to tap into your customers, to really listen to them and apply those insights to move your business forward. So with that, um, here's a little video of Jane telling us all about what Julep is all about. At Julep, our mission is to connect girlfriends through beauty to inspire growth. That's one reason why we name all of our nail colors after the women who inspire us. Our commitment to connection extends deeply into the way we work, even the way we innovate. So even though we're a small company, through Facebook and Pinterest, we can connect with millions of women to crowdsource the very best solutions. We not only listen to our customers, we actually collaborate with them. Through our social media communities, we connect everyday women from all over the country to the leading labs and chemists in beauty. These connections allow us to work faster to deliver more of what women really want. To me, the best part of beauty is the sharing. Every time we create a new color or product, our goal is to have women fall so madly in love that they want to pin it and tweet about it right away. Our final award winner today is uh, Scott Moore, who's SVP of Marketing for Best Buy. So you guys probably interact with Best Buy, whether it's online or in the store. In fact, 70% of U.S. consumers are usually within 15 minutes from a Best Buy location. So that really just shows their scale as a business. So Scott specifically, he's really um, helped reinvent the Best Buy brand in light of disruptive trends such as showrooming, right? Amazon, all of those big trends that are shaking up all retailers today. 
Um, touting the tagline, experience the ultimate showroom, Best Buy is striving to bring shoppers back into the store to make the best buying decisions. The retailer released a series of television ads during the 2013 holiday season to support that whole new vision. And as a company moving forward, Best Buy is focused on developing more targeted, relevant, and personalized digital communications across all touch points and all points of the shopping journey. Scott has helped orchestrate a deal for 1,400 stores within stores by Samsung, this one project that he just did alone. Um, and Best Buy is using this as a key tactic to match other competitors such as Apple in not just providing great products, but also generating brand loyalty and affinity. So again, sad Scott couldn't join us today, but um, thought it was important to showcase what he has done to bring Best Buy forward as well as the retail industry as a whole. So again, congratulations to Scott and uh, to all of our winners. Thanks again to all of you uh, for coming this afternoon. I think it was just it's just been priceless to be able to hear from all of these different types of retail innovators. Um, I think you know we, we've all learned a lot. I hope you've been able to network with each other um, and that you'll continue to be able to as well. Um, and those are all our winners. Just want to let everybody know this is this is our only awards program related. Uh, specifically to individual retail executives, but we have three other awards programs during the year that we run uh, that honors uh, individual that honors retail companies, uh, store operations superstar awards, channel innovation awards, and customer engagement awards. We just released our channel innovation awards recently. Uh, you can access that uh, that PDF report on our website. Customer engagement awards are the next ones coming up uh, around November timeframe. So be on the lookout for the ability to nominate a retail company for that as well. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we do have the landing page ready to go for next year's retail innovator awards. So uh, you can access that from our website as well. We'll be promoting that during the year, but. There's the link if you want to if you want to go ahead and nominate anybody at any time. Um, so again, I just want to wish all the retailers in the room um, all the best as you move into the holiday season. I, I know it's coming up, and hopefully you're all at least thinking about planning for the holidays. Um, we actually have a holiday guide that we'll be publishing in a couple of weeks. It's going to be pretty extensive co covering strategies for the holidays uh, across all kinds of areas. So look for that as well. Um, and then just finally, I, once again, I want to thank all of you for coming today. I want to congratulate all of our retail innovators and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Just try to stay cool. Maybe you want to stop at Jamba Juice on the way once you set, step outside. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>